Recording in progress. Hello, everyone. I'm your professor, Adam Dunstan. The title of this course, Land, Culture, and Tourism, is a weird one, right? Like, let's admit it. It's kind of weird because two of those words, land and culture, are two of the most profound and influential forces on humanity and on the history and future of humanity that we could possibly think of, right? We are profoundly shaped by our lands and we are, as Clifford Geertz said that Max Weber said, uh, very much creatures of our culture. We are um, creatures suspended in webs of our own significance, as the quote goes. And so land and culture are both profound in how they shape humanity. And then the third word in our course title, tourism, you look at that and you're kind of like, huh? Like, what the heck? How'd that get in there, right? Uh, it doesn't seem all that quite as weighty, perhaps, as the other two. Uh, and I can certainly relate to that. I never sort of set out to study tourism when I first started my career. But I hope to show that it, too, is fascinating and can tell us a great deal about what it means to be human. So that's a little bit about where we're going today uh, with the lecture. So. Let us begin. I want to focus on each word in turn. First word is land. So I ask people sometimes when I talk about this to think about their favorite place in the world. All right, do you have that picture in your head? Think a little bit longer if you don't. Okay, favorite place in the world. Be, be creative with it, not just like a bar that you like to go to or something. All right, maybe something a little more profound than your favorite restaurant. All right. Well, when I was in high school and early college, my favorite place in the world uh, was a small nature preserve that you can see in this picture and in the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, if I was to describe the sheer physicality of the space, I might mention that it's a place where there was a lot of geologic activities. So you have a lot of exposed rocks. I might mention that it has a lot of wildflowers in the area, that it's kind of a chaparral -y kind of forest in the midst of a lot of um, temperate rainforest. I might describe, you know, it's a few miles square and so on and so forth. And in describing it all such, you probably might start to wonder why was this your favorite place in the world, especially growing up in the Pacific Northwest, right? Uh, there are probably cooler places than this. But the thing is, right, if I was to describe why it was my favorite place, I would have to tell you all sorts of stories, stories about hours and hours and hours I spent with my friends here, whether it was, you know, skipping a class, whether it was um, going with friends to um, spend hours taking care of the space and taking out the invasive plants, because that was something we were into, because I was a big environmental nerd back then and arguably still am, um, whether it was just walking around the space, whether it was praying in that space or so many other things. I have just story after story about that space. And so it meant a lot more to me um, than just what the physicality of the space might suggest. I suspect the same is true of your favorite places. If I was to ask you about them, you could probably tell me the basics of what it looks like but you could also tell me perhaps what it smells like, what it feels like, what it sounds like. I've, I'm surprised always when I ask this kind of thing. Um, recently I asked this of a group of river guides and people were able to describe it really vividly, right? And people also not just the vivid ways in which our senses engage with the land, but also the stories we attach to it, both our own stories and perhaps cultural stories as well. Uh, things about the history of that space. It's more than just that space in other words, which is where we get to three related concepts that I want you to be familiar with because they are absolutely core to this class. If you have taken my culture and ecology course, you will be quite familiar with these concepts already, but it should still be useful review. And if not, um, you may have heard of these in other classes, but I'd like to go over them again. I think they're incredibly important and they peel back some layers and help us understand humanity better. So first one is space. Space is what it suggests, right? We use that as social scientists, we use that to describe the literal physical space itself. But then starting in this, especially in the 60s and 70s, but arguably before that, uh, but in the 60s and 70s with works of people like Yifu Tuan, Edward Casey, uh, later Keith Basso, 
uh, we started to talk about this idea of place and placemaking. Place being space versus place being the idea of space, the space itself, the physicality, but place meaning the meanings that we attach to a space. And actually, maybe attach to is the wrong word because that suggests that it's just some sort of pure social construction where we throw our ideas onto a space. But of course, the nature of land is that it pushes back, right? It doesn't accept every meaning. Um, I can't claim that Alaska is some land of endless cities when it's just not, right? And so um, maybe we should say the meanings that we have enmeshed with the space, but the, the stories we have, the histories we have, all the different ways that that place comes to mean something to us. And then placemaking is the way that A becomes B, the way that we transform space into place, which is something that humans always do. And let me share with you a few examples. If I was to talk about this spot on the map over here, I don't know if you can see where I'm, oopsie daisy, all right. If <laughs> that answered the question of what happens if I touch the screen, it, it makes the sides go back. So I won't do that, but about a third of the way up and about a middle of the screen, if I was to point there to that location, I would say, well, you know, what is that space? You'd say, well, it's a little piece of the East Coast of the United States, and we would agree. And if I was to tell you, well, it's about 10 miles square, and it's okay. It's a mix of different successional stages of the forest because forest grows through different stages. Um, so there's some grassland prairie, there is some wetlands, there is some mature oak hickory forest, there's some younger forest. And if I was to say all that to you, you'd say, okay, I mean, it sounds like a lot of kind of East Coast forests. It's, you know, there's farmlands that are slowly growing back into forests. That's a pretty common theme in a lot of our Eastern coast of the United States where we have a lot of lands that used to be farmlands that are growing back into forests through the natural processes of nature reclaiming a space. But it doesn't sound all that remarkable of a space, right? It's like so many other areas where there were farms and now it's becoming a forest again. But if I told you then that it's Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, that space takes on a whole new meaning because it is a specific kind of place. It is a place associated with the traumas of the Civil War, and it is indeed the most famous battle of the Civil War, arguably, and a very pivotal, pivotal moment in the history of the United States. Similarly, if I was to show you this river and mention, you know, it's about 80 miles long, um, that it descends about 400 feet over the course of its elevation, that it's glacial fed and lake fed and runoff fed and also aquifer fed, uh, that it drains a space of about 2,000 square miles. That's all interesting, especially if you're a hydrologist, but perhaps it doesn't tell you much about what the place really is. Uh, that place is Katnu, as it's known in Denaina, the original inhabitants of our land, or also known as Kenai River. In that place, um, is so much more than what I than just you know an 80 mi mile long river. It's a place where 3,000 years ago the river and Kachemak societies were fishing on this space and making their homes in this space, and where Denaina people uh, have lived here um, for incredibly long periods of time, making villages, catching fish sustainably, um, living meaningful human lives, finding ways to replicate the processes of creation and recreation and um, generally living, right? It is a place that is the Denaina Ethnena, the Denaina homeland among many other places in this area. It is also a place that it runs right through the town of Soldatna, a town that it, I live in or close to and is essentially defined by this river in large part, not the only reason, but one of the main reasons that we exist as a city um, is the sports fishing industry that's tied in with this large space, right, as well as the commercial fishing industry that's tied in with it. So there's a lot going on with this space, right? It's a place that, much like with Gettysburg, you know, just kind of a normal little forest slash farmland, but it gets a million visitors a year. That's as more than the population of Alaska. Similarly, Kenai River, is not just an 80 mile river, it's a river that people flock from many parts of our country and to some degree even the world to come see, to come fish, that means a lot to them and means a lot to us locally, right? So the Kenai River is much more than just what it might sound physically. Um, so these are all examples of us making space into place and that's something human beings do. We endow our meanings, we come to find ways of relating to 
our physical surroundings. And one of the most prominent ways that we always do that is that we make land into homelands, right? We make lands into homelands. And that's true of highly sedentary cultures, agricultural groups that stay in one place. Um, but that's also true of groups that we sometimes refer to as quote unquote nomadic, or that we sometimes refer to as um, more migratory in their living patterns, right? Even groups of people that move around a lot during the season, they move around a lot within a certain territory and that territory is home and they love that space and respect that space. Um, I wanted to share four examples of people making land into home. First one is the one we were just talking about, um, which is kind of the Kenai River and broader Cook Inlet area. But of course, it wasn't originally called Cook Inlet. Uh, that's only called that because of a short-lived and rather ill-fated expedition by Captain Cook um, shortly before his death. Instead, it was originally known as Tikatnu by Denina people. And this whole Cook Inlet area um, was Denina Esnena, Denina land, uh, much of it, I should say, there are a few parts of it that would have been Yupik land traditionally in Shukpiak land. And then the part I'm on, the Kenai Peninsula, was known as Yaganen, the good land, and it had dozens and dozens of place names across it as people came to name all these different mighty rivers, but even down to tiny little streams, right? So people made it into home. Um, moving around, if we go into the southwest, which is pictured on the upper right, you have uh, what we sometimes think of as the Four Corners area, which is a land of sort of high mountain desert intermixed with certain kinds of um, kind of pinyon junipery kind of, well, maybe that's the wrong way of describing it, but kind of sparse mountain forest interspersed with the occasional large mountain um, and mesas and things like that. That's a physical way of describing it, but what it really is um, to the people that live in most of the upper right-hand part of Arizona and into New Mexico and into Utah is Navajo country. It's Diné Bequeya, the traditional homelands of the Navajo people, a land that was thought of traditionally and still is thought of as being bounded by four sacred mountains, a blue, yellow, black, and white one. Actually, I did that the wrong. It should have been the white, blue, yellow, and black one. A land that is protected by the holy people and that is um, ordained for, established for the Navajo people and that they have a duty to protect. Uh, and there's more to it than that. But the point is, they made it home. Indeed, very literally, um, Navajo people will sometimes say that the mountains are like pillars of a hogan. A hogan is like a traditional Navajo home. It's like a well, the way they're made nowadays is like a log cabin, kind of a octagon log cabin. But anyways, the idea is that the mountains are the pillars of it that hold up the roof. Other people don't agree with that. But uh, the point is it's made into home. Um, it, going around the circle again, if we think about the island of Great Britain as just kind of an island, I don't want to say it's unimpressive. Um, particularly since my ancestors are from there and I don't want them to sort of come back from their graves and beat me up or something. Uh, but, you know, specifically the land of England, you know, it, it's pretty for sure, but it's rather a small part of the overall globe and perhaps not as geologically or ecologically as impressive as a lot of other places. However, to folks that live in Britain, it is the land of among other things, deep, deep histories, right? Stretching back, for example, to the Monument of Stonehenge. Now, that's arguably a different kind of culture, but it kind of gets claimed by modern English. Um, we'll actually do a reading about that later. But anyways, this land of England is also associated with kind of the British Empire and the fact that it used to stretch over much of the world. And although much of that empire has been dismantled, uh, there's still the idea of the Commonwealth, right? And these dozens of nations that sort of look towards England to some degree and have some degree of cooperation with each other. Um, there's the idea of a monarchy that goes back centuries and centuries and that some think of as divinely ordained to lead and rule in that land. And so my point with all of that is that England is a lot more than just a somewhat kind of cool island slightly north of France, right? It's a lot more than that to people that live in England. Uh, and then we could talk about China. China as a space is, of course, like several of these spaces, pretty amazing. But even perhaps more amazing to me as a social scientist is what it's come to mean to people. Um, on the right hand side is characters, Chinese characters that signify um, the word zhongguo. And forgive me if that was poor pronunciation, but I tried my best based on how I 
heard it from other people, Zhongguo, and it means middle kingdom. And the idea among certain early Chinese thinkers, actually many, um, that China was sort of the center of the world, that it was this sort of ultra civilized space where civilization had first sort of reared its head and that it was sort of premier within the space of the world. <clears throat> Um, some of that was helped by the fact that within their specific continent, <clears throat> China is rather central um, and is sort of bounded on one side by the ocean, on one side by the Himalayas, on one side by the Gobi Desert, right? So it's well protected uh, in a lot of ways. But anyways, the idea of the middle kingdom, right? The central kingdom, center of the world, as one of my, um, my good mentor, my first anthropology teacher, Professor Andrus said, and as he pointed out, this is not sort of unique to people in China, although they may have expressed it with a certain phrase. The idea of being at the center of the world is something that many cultures traditionally have conceptualized their homelands as. All of this to say, all of these words to say, that to dwell, by which I mean to transform lands into homelands, is one of our most universal traits as humanity. One of our most fundamental traits, whether our land is a large space that we move seasonally within, as was the case, for example, with um, certain areas of, for example, like the Great Basin historically and um, Shoshone peoples, or whether our lands are, you know, a small village that's allied with some other nearby small villages. Either way, we transform our lands into homes. It's one of our precursors of being a human being. Indeed, it's one of the most amazing things about us that we come from one specific homeland, arguably, um, in Africa, and then have spread around the entire world and made so many lands into homelands. But given this, given our propensity to make home, to dwell, to establish a place as our place, and to make it feel comfortable, and to make it feel like where we uniquely belong and where we have a unique relationship with the land, Given all that tendency, that raises some odd questions for a class about tourism. One of which is, why do we ever leave our homelands to visit other lands, right? If we invest so much of our meaning and our culture into making our spaces into our land, our home, and how meaningful it is in the relationship we have with it, why do we ever leave, right? Why do we ever travel to other spaces? And you might think that that's a simple question, and we'll see it's actually a lot more complicated than that across the history of humanity. So as Keenan puts it in a famous SNL sketch, and I love Jason Sudeik as they're dancing in his uh, tracksuit. But anyways, what's up with that? What's up with that? Also given all this, not just why do we ever leave, but why do we ever invite people into our homelands, right? Why do we ever um, invite people into our homeland. Sometimes tourism into a space is not voluntary, but many times it is. People um, choose to be a receiving culture, a host culture, and have people visit their lands. Uh, sometimes their economy is dependent upon it. Why do we do this? Why do we ever invite people into these lands that we love so much? And we'll see that that too is a more complicated question than you might think at first. <clears throat> 